worship in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, we have some special visitors with us this morning, and we will have an opportunity to meet them in just a few minutes. But I, I want to welcome you gentlemen, and we, we very much appreciate your willingness to come. Um, I am neglectful for not having pointed out, more specifically, our beautiful nativity set on our communion table. And that was a gift to the church from Suzanne and Frank Tours. And we have been enjoying it for several years. And if you're here at the end of the service and you have not done so, I encourage you to go up and look at the beauty of the individual pieces and the beauty of what looks like quilting um, on these. And Suzanne, I am afraid I can't tell them. So who are these by? Jim Shore. Jim Shore. And I, I think they're just a particularly beautiful nativity set. Um, there isn't a pig like mine has, but uh, aside from that, they're really, really beautiful. And I look forward to each year um, to us using them. So thank you again for your gift. Um, Barbara Campbell is with us this morning, and uh, we're delighted to welcome Barbara back. And uh, our scripture passage this morning, if you are watching from home and would like to have your Bibles close by, um, from the Old Testament, the passage is from Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 5, and our New Testament text is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, <coughs> verses 39 through 45. And uh, of course, if you uh, have your bulletin with you, um, the texts are always in the bulletin. And for those of you at home, you know that you can always download the bulletin on the YouTube site and, and Facebook. Um, a reminder that our Christmas Eve service, this coming Friday, I know, what happened to December? Uh, our Christmas Eve service this coming Friday will be at 5 p.m. Um, we hope all of you who live close by will be able to attend. We'll have our reading of scriptures, our singing of such popular um, <coughs> traditional carols that it's always fun to have an opportunity to sing together. And then there will be a lot of special music. And I think it will be a service that you will really be inspired by, whether you are able to be here and watch at 5 o'clock or whether you are watching from home. Many thanks to Alice and Ben Patterson for being our Advent readers this morning as well as providing our special music. So, um, I already called them a dynamic duo, but I think I should do it in public. And, and as always, thank you to Ruth for, for providing our music. Um, indeed, a faithful servant. So, Curtis, would you like to do our presentation? Smith and I'm a member along with these five gentlemen of the Mill City Gates American Legion Post 159. And these guys have been the workhorses for the last several years. I'm the financial officer, and our commander of the post is Toby Fensel right here. So he's our fearless leader. But the guy that does most of the work is next to him, Bruce. He's He's our, we call him an adjutant, right? Yeah. Got it right. Among other things, we call him that. <laughs> Bruce Brunstad. And so, and then next to me is a former commander, and now he's, he's the, what do you call him again? Vice, Vice, Vice commander, because he supervises, and, and then he tells us how we should have done it after we already did it. And, but it just came. <laughs> All these guys are, are responsible for keeping the post open as long as it has been. But we decided to close, and um, most of our members may probably transfer to the state and post to the American Legion. But we wanted to make some financial contributions to worthy causes here in Mill City and Gates. 
So, I have a little letter here explaining what we're doing, along with a check. So I'm going to put my cheaters on here, so I can get it out. To Mill City Presbyterian Church, our American Legion post will be closing and members will be transferring to the state and post. As we close, we want to make a financial contribution to the churches in Mill City and Gates. The post is voted to donate $5,000 to Mill City Presbyterian Church to support their ministry to the people of the San Diego King. With best wishes and God's blessings. Mark Smith, I'm the finance officer in the post chaplain. So I get to write the checks. That's the fun part. So and I guess this is the fellow who takes care of the money. God bless you. Thank you very much. And God bless you. I, uh, uh, as Carol told you, I, the, the stewardship chairman, um, monies in the Presbyterian Church are, are uh, the, the folks who make the decision. It's called the session. Um, but as most churches, we have a, uh, a mission fund. And, and these are monies that are used both locally and actually worldwide. Um, for, for helping people. Um, as stewardship chairman, I will be recommending to the uh, session that these funds go into our mission, our local mission fund, so that they will be the purpose for which you have donated them. And we appreciate, appreciate very much your service, and we appreciate your contribution. Thank you. You're welcome. And if you'll pardon us, we have to get to another service because we have some more presentations to make in the community. So, God bless you all. Uh, I just want to say one thing, um, and I'm probably not politically correct, but I don't care. But I just want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Okay. And, and, and we're, we're not about. I, I'd also like to note that these same gentlemen gave a very generous donation to the food bank. And so we have been doubly blessed. Doubly blessed. What a nice thing to do. Yeah. And uh, think of all the people that those contributions will help throughout the community. Aren't, aren't we pleased that we're one of the ones that they chose? Um, do you have any announcements this morning? I have comments. Diane, when I was here last night, you mentioned that we were doing a live activity in the city, and that's been canceled with people who are hosting it and have to take it. So please keep the hand signals in your prayer. Okay. Are there other announcements this morning? Yes, and I guess this is kind of an announcement. Maybe you are all already doing this and aware, but I just read a really excellent article this morning that's talking about with this CDP renewed round of COVID infections and hospitalizations, what you should do to prepare just in case you might get it, you might not. But um, it was really an excellent article. And for some of you, but think about be sure you have food stuffs, you know, particularly can that you could easily fix or someone else. Um, and like be sure you have medications, including, you know, aspirin, including just like this. When you get sick, what's showing up now is it's often very hard until you have the test to know if it's the flu or a bad cold or COVID. So, you know, some of those regular medications are cold. But anyway, it was a, it was a really great article. And I um, found it under the box, V-O-X, which is um, just a news service, you know, that puts out articles. But um, there may be something else under CDC, you know, listing. But I thought it was just a really good reminder to be prepared because, um, you know, you may be a lot sicker than you think you may be. And some of these things could help you not have to try to find somebody to go get things for you, too. Excellent, Sandy. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, one of the things that I read is that if you have had your vaccine, 
shots, but you have not had, um, what's it called? Your booster. Oh, wasn't what I was thinking at all. Um, if you haven't had your booster, do you think that it will be effective um, in warding it off? So just a word to all of us. Um, if there are no further announcements, let's begin with an opening prayer. Loving God, remind us that like Mary, each one of us is a bearer of your good news. We are called to proclaim hope, peace, joy, and love in your name. Open our hearts to receive with joy the love that you have for us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now our prayer. spoke to the people of Israel through the prophet Micah. Micah promised them a ruler from the tiny town of Bethlehem to love the people as a shepherd loves the flock. Mary's baby was born in Bethlehem and she sang of God's love. It is a love that puts down the mighty from their thrones and raises up the lowly. It is a love that fills the hungry with good things and fills hearts with love. So we light this candle of love, celebrating the love that came out of Bethlehem, the love that changes everything. Will you join with me in the response? <clears throat> oh God of love, from a stable in a tiny town, you taught us the meaning of love. Help us to rejoice with Mary in how your love changes everything. Amen.
it is at this point in our worship that we share our celebrations and our concerns. Are there any that you would like to share this morning? Suzanne? Um, I asked for prayers a while ago for one of our former classmates who lives in Texas right now, and I received a Christmas card from her with a letter, and she has indeed had cancer again. She's gone through chemo and radiation, is doing well, and said she doesn't have to go in for a checkup until March. So we're thankful uh, for Tony. That is wonderful news. Yeah. But we will continue to keep her in our prayers. Yes. Are there others? Yes. So fantastic that we were attended the community Christmas event over at Stuart Hall last night, and the community chorus was able to sing for the first time together. In some time, uh, Alice participated, and Joy E. and Francis McGuire, and Georgia was there too. And so it was just a lot of fun with carols and treats. And so next year, people ought to put that on their list. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Are there others? Well, let me throw one in the hat that is still uh, very, very important. Hang on just a second. Uh, prayers for the victims as well as the recovery efforts in the Midwest following the tornadoes, and especially Kentucky. Kentucky, I think, was the worst hit. And the tornadoes continuing. It is evidently going to be one of the worst of tornado seasons. But if you would like to donate toward those efforts, uh, you can donate through the Presbyterian Disaster Relief Fund. And the way to do that is simply like we have done before, uh, we did the same, I believe, for Haiti, is just in the memo line of your church, uh, of your check, if you even just put tornadoes or disaster relief, but Presbyterian Disaster Relief um, is where it will go. And it's money so well spent, they use it so carefully, and they help so, so many people. And uh, you just make it out to the church. Can we do anything else, Becky, that would be helpful? If, if uh, people online uh, watching can just do it online. At the, OK. The, and you can't do it online. Yeah. Um, are there others? Yes, Suzanne? I was going to say a, a, a praise and a thank you in advance. I heard Alice and Ben practice it. Uh, <laughs> That's good. Yes. Um, I got word to this week that the uh, captives in Haiti uh, were able to escape and be rescued. Uh, so all of them have now gotten away from Haiti and from their captives. I don't know if that's been on the news. I haven't heard about it. I'd rather not hear that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, that is a uh, marvelous celebration. And a lot of people have prayed about that. And that is the captives in Haiti have now all been released and uh, presumably have gone home. So, and, and blessings and all sorts of thank yous to those who conducted the rescue mission and were able to achieve that. Um, are there others? Yes. Well, I say, the last time I was here, I was mentioning that I was going to be gone last week for my mom's 80th birthday summer. <clears throat> and I just want to say that Zoom is great for these kinds of things. My mom is very nervous about it. She doesn't like how her picture came in. But um, I took pictures of her and my dad um, and posted them on Facebook. And they were like, wow, they look great for Amy. So, uh, but the Zoom thing was great. And the grandkids all got to join, and it was beautiful. So, Well, what a wonderful celebration. And Think how many people got to take part that way, too. Yeah. So, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, are there others? It is indeed a busy week coming up for, for so many people. Uh, but let us not forget those that, unfortunately, in the spirit of Christmas and in all the hubbub of gift giving and all, that it will not be a busy week. And so let's especially remember those who are homeless, those who are without shelter, and let us also remember those that with the inevitability of, of life in general, 
will probably be experiencing a death in the family this week. So we ask prayers for them and simply a reminder that we, while we enjoy all that we have, that we be mindful of those who haven't. Um, let's have a moment of silent prayer. So let us pray and thank to God all those things that are within our hearts and have gone unspoken. So let us pray silently. Lord, we can't quite imagine what it must have been like for Mary to hear God's request and to respond unconditionally with, yes. Forgive us for our lack of faith, Lord. Slow us down, cause us to take time to really consider the wonderful ways you have already been working in our lives and the wondrous ways you will work in our lives in the future. As we have come before you with concerns on our hearts for our families, friends, and the world in general, remind us that your presence is with us and your healing love comforts and restores us. Let us use our talents and resources to help others. Give us courage, energy, and enthusiasm as we do your work in the world. We lift up those who are recovering from medical treatment, as well as those who are facing treatment in the near future. We pray for the medical personnel who will care for them. We pray for the family members who will be supportive of them. We pray especially for the caretakers, who so often so much is asked of. And may we as a church find ways that we might be supportive of them. We pray for our shut-ins, those dealing with long-term illnesses, and we pray that they will feel your strength and your comfort. We lift up Sandy, Robin, Terry, Lance, Steve, Kara, Larry, and Scott. We ask for God's comfort and healing in their lives. And as we do each week, O oh Lord, we lift up our troops, those serving around the world, we are grateful for their service. We pray daily for their safety, as well as for comfort and hope for their families, especially during this time of Christmas. And now we join together in the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now it is our treat to have special music, not just one number, but two numbers that Ben and Alice are going to do. And the first one they're going to do is Mary Had a Baby. So Ben and Alice Patterson. Mary had a baby. 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 My Lord, where was he born, my Lord? Where was he born, my? Where was 
for the gifts that you pour into our lives. We bring a small portion of those gifts back to you. And as we bring them to the church, we ask for your guidance in how best to reach out to your children, to your world, for those in need not only of financial help, but in need of hope and love. So we thank you that you are so generous with us. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And our song of prayer is number 250, O Look Town of Bethlehem.
Carol showed me you'd seen this dance before. <laughs> I'm, I'm hopeful that their next pastor will be more technical. Well, when I heard the announcement about the Lion Nativity, first of all, and then heard Alice and Ben sing of Mary Had a Baby, I want to begin by just telling you about a manger. Um, St. Mark, where I pastored for 13 years and recently left, had a life-size manger every Christmas Eve. Fill of hay and some blankets and a star that actually lit it up. And every Christmas Eve, we managed to find, sometimes very miraculously, a live baby Jesus, or Gisette, as you maybe call it, when it was girls, <laughs> that laid in that manger. And at the end of the Christmas Eve service, when the lights were low and we were lighting our candles and singing Silent Night, we had in front of us a baby, a real life baby, lying in this manger with a star shining. In. And we never once had a baby that cried, which was even more amazing. Although we had a mom nearby, just in case. And when St. Mark closed a few years ago, and their members went on to strengthen other congregations nearby, that manger uh, came with me, went with me to my garage. <laughs> and I've been trying to find a congregation that would like to use the manger and keep it for us. And I talked to Carol last week, and she graciously accepted to let me bring it to you. Um, and so I've been riding around with the manger baby Jesus in the back of my car uh, for a while, and I'm just delighted to, to know that it'll be here in safe hands, that there's a actually a life community major that might be able to use it and that this congregation can have it whenever they need it. And if there isn't anything that speaks more of love, I don't know what it would be than a baby, a newborn baby. The face um, just epitomizes what love is all about. So we read of a couple of babies and we hear about babies today in our gospel text from Luke. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Thanks be to God. So can you believe we're only six days from Christmas? And we've had to wait this long to hear something that is beginning to sound like our Christmas story. We usually say that the story is of the actual birth of Jesus each year from reading on Christmas Eve, because this is what the common lectionary advises. 
There's only one problem with that system that occurred to me a couple of years before I retired. Few churches have a sermon on Christmas Eve. So there's seldom a chance to reflect on what these, this story, these stories, which are different in the Gospels, mean to us. In fact, the lectionary on Christmas Eve gives us the same gospel story each year, which includes only the first half of Luke chapter 2. First half of Luke chapter of Luke. And sometimes the first 14 verses from the Gospel of John, which begin with those words we know so well. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, the well-known Christmas pageants that we have loved throughout our lives are mostly Luke's pageant. Perhaps a tiny bit of Matthew thrown in if you have enough children to play wise men. Matthew's gospel, you see, leaves out the story of shepherds and angels. Matthew, however, is the only gospel to include the story of wise men. And the horrible tale, actually, we find in Matthew as well, of the massacre of the infants by an angry and frightened King Herod. Matthew's story reveals the harshest realities of human existence, especially in the ancient Middle East at the time that Jesus was born. Mark's gospel, the oldest and therefore thought to be the most original gospel, does not include any birth narrative for Jesus. No story of how Jesus was born, but begins with John the Baptist appearing in the wilderness and a grown-up Jesus coming to him to be baptized. There's no birth narrative in John's gospel either. John tells of the word being with God in the beginning, and then follows Mark's lead with John baptizing Jesus. The late scholar Marcus Borg, who was a Portland native, explained the historical context of Jesus' birth, calling it the grinding tectonics of the imperialism plate against the Judaism plate. That was as ancient as the genocide that Pharaoh made against the Israelites a thousand years earlier. The grinding between empire and faith. During the time of Jesus left, the kingdom of Rome and the kingdom of Yahweh pushing up against each other with all their might. The term kingdom of God as it's used in scripture, is not so much about territory or ethnic identity, but about a mode of economic distribution, a type of human organization and a style of world order, social justice and peace. The Greco-Romans believed in immortal gods and goddesses who controlled the world. They also believed that a human could, come, could become divine through extraordinary or transcendental service to the world. Usually such divinity was bestowed after the death of that human. But Octavian, better known as Caesar Augustus, a Latin name which meant divine one who should be worshiped, Caesar Augustus was deified while still living, for he had saved the entire Roman Empire by defeating Mark Anthony and had brought peace to the Mediterranean world. So let's get back to the Christmas pageant that the author of Luke writes for us in the middle of this theological clash with Rome. The scenery backdrop behind Luke's pageant would certainly include the dark shadows 
of the world of oppression and violence into which Jesus was born. But on stage, stage front, Luke begins with chapter one, a story of two miraculous pregnancies and the hope of two mothers-to-be. Chapter one in Luke begins with the birth of John, who would later be called the Baptist. John's elderly parents, the priest Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, had waited forever to have a child. But Elizabeth had remained there. The angel Gabriel, by the way, appearing only in Luke's pageant, comes first to Zechariah, not to be confused with Zechariah, by the way, at the temple altar where he was a priest. Gabriel does what all angels of the Lord do best, and usually first, he dispels fear, saying, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers have been answered. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. Then Gabriel continues, you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, and he will make ready a people prepared for their Lord. Now Zechariah does what any of us would do at this point. He questions the possibility of such a miracle. How often have each of us questioned the possibility of things too wonderful to hope for? Things that we can no longer believe in. We're adults, after all. So what have you given up believing in? I imagine there may have been just a moment of giving up joy and hope each time this dang COVID variant is discovered. When someone we love dies, grief tempts us to give up. When unemployment or struggling to make ends meet continues month after month, we find it hard to believe that things will get better someday. A natural disaster strikes out of nowhere, a flood, raging forest fires, a pandemic, or a tornado that destroys everything in its 200 mile path. Due to his disbelief, the angel Gabriel predicts that Zechariah will become unable to speak until the promise he had hoped for beyond all returns. Now Zechariah hid at home for a while and then went back to work in the temple, only giving the bewildered people hand signals, I guess, since he could no longer speak. Elizabeth, however, conceived a child and remain in seclusion for five months, saying to herself, I imagine, the Lord has looked favorably on me and has taken away the disgrace that I've endured among my people. Then in the very next verse we read, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to Nazareth to a young woman, a maiden, named Mary, who was engaged to a man named Joseph. Gabriel says to Mary, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. Mary doesn't become afraid, as folks normally do when an angel speaks to them. She just is a little confused. <laughs> and wonders why she's being called favored one. Gabriel gives her the usual greeting, 
kindly, saying, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. That's pretty political language for Jesus. The, the words that Gabriel uses sound familiar to Luke's original audience for a reason. Luke wants to make it very clear that even before Jesus was conceived, he was created to be holier and mightier than any ruler of Rome. Now Gabriel has to spend some time convincing Mary, telling her that the Holy Spirit would come upon her and that her child would be holy, the Son of God? I don't know if that would convince me. And then he tells her that her relative Elizabeth conceived a son six months ago in her old age, for nothing is impossible with God. Mary, the mother of a mortal son of God, clearly a unique woman of faith, stops thinking about it and says, maybe to Gabriel, maybe to herself, we're not sure. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then Mary does what many young women today might have done if they were unmarried and pregnant. She goes with haste to visit her older female relative in another country, out in the hills. If you can picture, if you can't picture the stage of our pageant at this point in the story, you will see that Luke casts two women and puts them center stage, very early in his birth story, playing leading roles. And when Mary walks into the house, the child in Elizabeth's womb does somersaults. And Elizabeth, taking the movement as a holy sign, blesses Mary for believing that Gabriel's promise would be fulfilled in Mary's child. Mary celebrates with the beautiful song of faith and hope that we heard read this morning, just the first section of it goes on for some time. And Mary praises God and sings aloud for God's gift of hope, God's gift of peace and joy, as if they had already become a reality. Mary trusts in God's promises so completely that she sings God has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and has sent the rich away empty. She sings as if these things have already come to be. Mary stays with Elizabeth for about three months, and having found perhaps the courage that she finally needed to return to her own village, that's where she heads off. Elizabeth's baby is born not much later, by my math, and Elizabeth's friends and relatives rejoice with her. But the Lord has shown such great mercy to her. As Act 1 of Luke's Christmas pageant ends with joy and love, as the courageous Elizabeth begins to break with tradition, 
Instead of giving their son the name of a relative, as everyone expected, Elizabeth says, no, he is to be called John. And all the people turn and stare at her husband, stare at the muted prophet. And he writes on a tablet, his name is John. As his mouth is opened and his tongue is freed, Zechariah begins to speak, and his first words give praise to God. Zechariah, in good priestly fashion, goes back to prophesy and finally finds his courage and his voice and declares in the present perfect tense again that Mary had used, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for God has looked favorably on his people and has redeemed them. Then looking down on his child, John, I imagine he says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins, by the tender mercy of our God dawns from on high and will break upon us, will break upon us, future tense now to give light to those who sit in darkness and to guide their feet into the way of peace. So thanks be to God on this Sunday before we come to a night, a holy night of Christmas Eve and hear the story again and remember the images that we've seen in many a Christmas pageant. We have already received these gifts of hope and peace and joy and love. Even though we sometimes have to dig pretty deep to find them, to feel them, or to share them with others, we've already received them. May the hope and peace and joy and love of Christmas lead us to know the child that lays in the manger, teaching on the hillsides, healing in the villages, sacrificing his life for ours, so that love can make a home in our heart for good. Thanks, good to go.
Let us go out into the world with hope <coughs> and peace and joy and love and return no one evil for evil. Let us strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit as we love the Lord our God. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us this day and every day. Amen. Thank you.